Thanks. So um, I'm Michael Weiss. I'm a neuromuscular neurologist here at the University of Washington, for those of you who don't know me. And I'm going to talk about the spectrum of myotonic disorders today. And we're going to look at disorders that are subdivided under the category of dystrophic myotonias, that is myotonic dystrophy. And, and we're going to talk about type 1 and type 2, which is also known as proximal myotonic myopathy. And I'll explain why in a few moments. We're, then we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about the non-dystrophic myotonias. And these are myotonias without weakness. And these include the chloride channel disorders, that is the sort of the skeletal muscle chloride channel and those that affect the skeletal muscle sodium channel. I'm going to briefly talk about acquired myotonias, which are toxic myotonias as a consequence of medications that cause myotonic discharges on needle EMG without clinical myotonia. And then I'm going to talk about some myopathies in which we can often find myotonic discharges without clinical myotonia that might be confused with myotonic dystrophy. So the pathophysiology of all myotonia really comes down more or less to two different kinds of channel problems. And this is, that is, the sodium channel, or SCN4A in particular, or the chloride channel 1 um, subtype of chloride channel. And so this is a, a neuromuscular junction, and this is the muscle membrane here. And ordinarily what happens is action potentials are propagated down a terminal motor nerve axon forces vesicles of acetylcholine to release their contents that then bind to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. But in addition to that, there's opening of sodium channels, and in particular SCN4A, which drives positively charged sodium uh, elect, um, ions into the, mu the, uh, the muscle compartment intracellularly, and that depolarizes the muscle membrane and muscles, the muscle contracts. In order to repolarize the membrane, potassium is forced out of the intracellular compartment of the muscle. And, um, and so one other thing happens, that potassium finds its way into this system called the T-tubular system, which is a barrier between the intracellular and extracellular membrane, of the, or muscle membrane. And um, that is offset because that those, those positively charged potassium ions accumulate in the T-tubular system. And that's offset to prevent additional depolarization of the muscle membrane by chloride making its way intracellularly through it, the chloride channel 1, uh, these cha the, this particular channel. And in, so if there's impairment of the sodium channel to a genetic mutation, what happens is the sodium channels don't inactivate. And then there are periods of time where the muscle membranes are is continuously being or intermittently being depolarized when it's not supposed to be, when the patients relax, and that's what it causes myotonia or myotonic discharges on needle EMG. The same thing occurs if there's a, an impairment of the chloride channel as a, due to a, a mutation in the chloride channel 1 gene. And again, the muscle membrane becomes depolarized when it's not supposed to be. And then uh, patients, when they're relax they can't relax their muscles even though they're trying to. And, they, they, and that's what myotonia is. So let's talk about the dystrophic myotonias first. And these, the prototypical disease is myotonic dystrophy type 1. And this is multifaceted. So there are very prominent neurologic symptoms that can occur with myotonic dystrophy type 1. Weakness, dysphagia, of course, myotonia. Patients can have cognitive impairment. They can have personality disorders. And in particular, avoidant personality disorders has been described as, as being fairly common in myotonic dystrophy type 1. It's multisystemic, though. Also, patients get endocrinopathies like diabetes mellitus and thyroid disease. Uh, they very commonly have cardiac issues, conduction defects, and cardiomyopathy. And I'm going to speak to that in a more detail a little, little later in the talk. <coughs> they get these polychromatic cataracts that, sh that really sp that kind of sparkle with these different colored lights on slit lamp testing. And they're, they're often called Christmas tree cataracts, which are nearly pathognomonic for myotonic dystrophy. And then they're at greater risk of neoplasms. So if a patient walks into your clinic and he has, has this facial appearance, and you see this enough times, which, and I see this fairly frequently in the muscular dystrophy clinic, you're not going to mistake this for just about anything else. This patient has this long face. It's called a hatchet-faced appearance. He's, he's exhibiting frontal balding, he's got temporal wasting, and he's got some facial weakness. He's also got ptosis. You can see that here. He does not have ophthalmoparesis 
or diplopia, or you don't, won't, won't, you won't typically report diplopia. And so this is the pattern of weakness of my, myotonic dystrophy, type 1 at least. Facial weakness, involvement of levator palpebrae muscles of the eyelid, so they get ptosis, neck involvement, and the neck extensors and flexors are involved. They get involvement of the diaphragm and intercostal muscles, so they can get respiratory involvement. And then the, in the extremities, the weakness is very difficult than most myopathies, which are more proximal than distal. Here, this is a more distal than proximal myopathy, at least initially. And in particular, in the hands, the finger flexors are quite prominently affected in myotonic dystrophy type 1. And this is an example of that, that, those poly, that polychromatic cataract I mentioned earlier, Christmas tree cataracts. Nearly path, not 100% pathognomonic, but nearly pathognomonic for myotonic dystrophy. Yes? What's the soot lamp, and what is it doing to elicit that? What's that? What's the soot lamp? Is it just a normal light source, it's or is a, it special? It's a just a special, it's what the ophthalmologists are doing to look at cat, it, different parts of the eye in more careful fashion. The back of the eye, too. Like as a visible as, light, though, yeah. they shine in. Yeah. There. So, of course, the feature that distinguishes this disease the most from other myopathies is this. So, patients having percussion of the femur muscle of the hand, typically, there should not be this hang-up where the thumb is just stuck in a position for a short, short period of time. But here, there clearly is. There's delayed relaxation of the muscles following percussion. The thenar muscles are the most prominently affected, I, I think, in myotonic dystrophy type 1 at least. The other muscles that are grip muscles, the muscles help in patients grip. So the patient can't open up her fingers normally. Two of the most prominent features that we see in, my, in myotonic dystrophy type 1 patients. And this, I don't have a good video of this. This is a patient with, my, with myotonic dystrophy type 1 with tongue my, myotonia. There's, contraction of the tongue. What I usually do is I take a tongue blade and I have them stick out their tongue and I tap the blade and then this is what this is really what, what will happen, not in every patient, but in many patients, but fairly substantial clinical myotonia. So um, how do we know that this is uh, due to, uh, this is truly myotonia or it's typically it's, it's the, the adjunct finding is on needle EMG. In addition to seeing changes that are consistent with a myopathy, which are typically small potentials, motor unit action potentials, or summated potentials, and um, and also uh, early, so it's called early recruitment with minimal effort, the patient will flood the screen with units, which is a compensatory mechanism for loss of muscle fibers. We see this feature, which typifies a myotonic disorder. So these are waveforms that wax and wane with frequency and amplitude. They're elicited with needle movement and percussion. They're a form of spontaneous activity, and they can be variable amplitude, variable frequency, but they're also often quite fast in frequency. The, the way they're described has changed over the years, so Dr. Swanson might have heard the term dive bomber sound when he was training, and but nobody, I don't think that, that residents probably know what a dive bomber sounds like these days. So. So the probably more contemporary description would be a motorcycle revving up. I think that's probably the best description that I've heard recently. Maybe chainsaw, somebody turning on a chainsaw. So myotonic dystrophy type 1 is the most common adult muscular dystrophy that we see with a prevalence of about 1 to 8,000, so it's not all that uncommon. And it's unfortunately a disease in which mortality, uh, there's increased mortality. And so this is one of the preliminary studies to look at this by uh, this group in the, I think it was in the Netherlands, to Smolders and colleagues. And in this group of patients that were followed, they were looked at retrospectively. They looked at about 85 patients. They found that most, the, that there's a mean age of death of 40, 54 years. And it's probably about, still about that number now. So what are the causes of mortality? Well, those are in particular cardiac causes, as we'll talk about in more detail in a moment. Infection, in particular, aspiration pneumonia as they get advancing dysphagia. The esoph remember the esophageal muscles, two-thirds of the muscle are skeletal muscle, and so those, can, those are impacted by myotonic dystrophy. And then neoplasm can occur at increasing incidence, not, not dramatically increased, but definitely increased, and I don't know the, how, how much more frequently off the top of my head. And because of the cardiac issues, they're more vulnerable to stroke. 
Myotonic dystrophy type 2 is also known as proximal myotonic myopathy, and it, 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 right now we think it's less common than type 1, but I think it's also underdiagnosed. So I see patients who, um, because it it's often presents with minimal signs, who come to my office and they have a little bit of proximal weakness and they look like every other kind of myopathy. They don't have distal weakness. They often don't have facial weakness. And, um, or they have minimal weakness. And sometimes they're sent to me because somebody did an EMG because somebody, I had a patient who was in a car accident. She developed a whiplash injury. She had an EMG and EMG identified myotonic discharges. I saw the patient. She really had no symptoms other than maybe cataracts. And I diagnosed her with type two myotonic dystrophy. So the symptoms, though, do overlap with type 1 to some extent besides the pattern of weakness, which is much more proximal. They can have early onset cataracts, Christmas tree cataracts, diabetes mellitus, and thyroid disease. They don't usually get myotonia that's either apparent clinically to the patient or on examination. That makes it a challenge. They often have a lot of nonspecific muscle pain, and as I mentioned, the weakness pattern is different, too. It's much more proximal, hence the name proximal myotonic myopathy. And the EMG, often, although it often shows evidence for myopathy, the, um, when, um, the small potentials that I mentioned with volition, sometimes it's very hard to identify myotonic discharges. And often they just sort of, they don't have the wax, the classic appearance. They, instead of waxing and waning, they just wane. And there, there have been even a few studies to suggest occasionally you don't find them at all. And that makes it very challenging. And I guess you could argue, why are we calling it myotonic dystrophy? Um, if they, some, often we don't find many, if any, myotonic discharges, and they don't get clinical myotonia, but that, that's a reasonable argument, but they're still categorized as a form of myotonic dystrophy. So uh, in order to make a diagnosis, we don't usually do a muscle biopsy, but I find that sometimes patients get biopsied, especially with type 2 myotonic dystrophy, because they look like every other kind of myopathy. And these are the features that we see. So this is on H&E staining, low power magnification, and off, it uses a normal, so more or less normal size muscle fiber, polygonal si muscle fiber. This is a cross section. And usually the fibers don't vary that much in size, but here there's a lot of fiber size variability, like this fiber is a lot smaller than this one. And then the nuclei for the myofibers are usually along the periphery. And here they're internalized. So you see a lot of that in myotonic dystrophy, but these are very nonspecific features that you could see with other muscle diseases and wouldn't necessarily help you to know the patient on myotonic dystrophy. But you can sometimes see a feature that is more helpful. You can see that these are bags of nuclear material with, that are separate from the muscle fibers, and they're sometimes called either nuclear bags or pycnotic clumps. You can also see them not so much in other myopathies, but in neurogenic <coughs> disorders, like um, some chronic neurogenic injury, you could see them too, so they're not specific. But if you were to see them in a, in a suspected myopathy, it would make you think that the patient might have myotonic dystrophy. And in patients with more severe disease, what happens over time is a lot of the muscle gets replaced by fibrous connective tissue, which is what this is here, and there's a lot more fiber size variability, of more of a dystrophic appearance. <coughs> But so we don't usually do a biopsy to make a diagnosis. Obviously, the EMG can help us if patients have myotonic discharges, but we do genetic testing. And the genetic testing is quite interesting in myotonic dystrophy because both type 1 and type 2 myotonic dystrophy are due to repeat expansions. In type 1, it's a repeat expansion in the DMPK gene, and we don't really know exactly what that gene does, but I'll explain what we do know happens in a molecular fashion in just a moment. And type 2, is that's, and that's a trinucleotide repeat expansion, CTG, repeat expansion. Type 2, it's a CCTG repeat expansion in the CNBP gene, which is also called the zinc finger 9 protein gene, if I remember correctly, which is a transcriptional gene. In myotonic dystrophy type 1, there is something called anticipation. Anticipation means from generation to generation. There is a uh, earlier presentation of the disease, typically, and a worsening phenotype. And that correlates with the number of repeat expansions. So um, there's actually a congenital form that's quite severe. Um, begins in, in, in the neonatal period. And the, I don't know if you can see this, but this is suggesting that virtually all of these patients have at least 1,000 repeat expansions. There's a childhood onset form with at least um, 800 or up to 800 or typically, wait, I'm sorry, at least 800 repeat expansions. 
an adult onset form that's somewhere between 50 to 1,000, so it's a fairly substantial range here. Um, and fewer repeats, less than, or 100 or less, mild to late onset, or some, and then this sort of gray area or premutation phase, 38 to 49, and then normal would be 37 or less. So um, that's how, how we, th so we, there really is a clear correlation between the number of repeats and the severity of the disease and the, an and the anticipation. Myotonic dystrophy type 2, though, does not exhibit anticipation. And I don't remember what the cutoff is for being in a, in a, uh, having enough repeats to, to be to likely have the disease, but I've seen patients with as many as 15,000 repeats have minimal symptoms. And I've seen similar patients with much more substantial proximal uh, weakness. So it doesn't, there's, there's no anticipation type 2. Why that is, I don't know. And, um, and they're real, and it can be also quite much more subtle than type 1. And, type and 2 is also autosomal dominant. Yeah, I'm sorry, they're both autosomal dominant. I didn't mean to, I, I neglected to mention that. They're both autosomal dominant. So this is a study that tried to identify the survival based on uh, the phenotype, which I think is interesting. This is a study that dates back about 15 years ago, published in Neurology. It's, so this is looking at the, the survi cumulative survival over the course of 10 years. These are Kaplan-Meier survival curves. And looking at um, the different phenotypes based on mild adult, early adult, or childhood, and there really is, there's maybe not much of a difference between adult and early adult, there's a big difference between mild and childhood presentation. Uh, and be, the earlier it begins, the, the shorter is the survival. And then congenital form, those, those babies often don't survive infancy. It's that severe. And actually, there is also some, some survival data based on the pattern of weakness. And some patients don't have much weakness, and those are the patients that, are, that survive the longest. And then patients with more distal weakness, which is usually the on, onset where they have more distal, they have an intermediate to survival. And then they have a lot of proximal weakness, which can develop over time. They, they have the, low, the, the worst prognosis in terms of survival. So we, we, getting back to what the gene does. And so this is what's been proposed, and it really ha it hasn't changed too much, our idea about what, what's happening with this disorder, with type 1 at least. And it's probably not terribly dissimilar in type 2. But we think what's happening is there's impaired splicing of pre-messenger RNA into messenger RNA, and then it's affecting translation of the, of the gene product. And, and that has to do with the fact that normally there's this protein called muscle blind that does all that splicing. And, in, and this is an example of the, one of the genes that's involved in myotonic dystrophy, and there are multiple genes that are affected by, this, by in regard to impaired splicing, like the insulin gene for diabetes. But we're talking, um, this is specifically the gene that accounts for myotonia, which is a chloride channel 1 gene. And so what happens is ordinarily there's a protein called muscle blind that promotes normal splicing. And then in myotonic dystrophy type 1, because of the expanded repeats, muscle blind is sequestered in the nucleus. So it doesn't make its way to the pre-messenger RNA, it does, and, it, and that alters splicing. It impairs splicing. And what happens is you can get nonsense-mediated decay of the gene product at times, and so there's decreased amount of the product. And then in the case of chlor the chloride channel 1 gene, decreased channel density and increased muscle uh, excitability leading to myotonia and myotonic discharges. But this is just one example looking specifically at the chloride channel 1 gene, but this has impact, this impacts on other genes, as I mentioned, that cause a lot of the, the multisystemic uh, manifestations of myotonic dystrophy. So what, how do we treat these patients? Well, regrettably, there is no disease-modifying therapy for either type 1 or type 2 myotonic dystrophy, but, but there is some exciting, exciting new developments in an ongoing trial I'm going to talk about in a moment. But there's a lot of surveillance. Because this is multisystemic, there are considerations for the heart, so we, we always do a routine electrocardiogram. I usually, when I first see the patient, I usually get them to see a cardiologist to, to get a baseline. Often the cardiologist does a baseline transthoracic echocardiogram too. And I, at the very least, will do an annual electrocardiogram. I, I will also check their vital capacity measurement, typically a diagnosis, and this table says symptomatic. Sometimes I'll even do it one, even these days I'm doing it once a year, I'd say, just, even if they're not symptomatic, just to be sure that I keep an eye on their, 
their breathing capacity or the rest, whether they're developing restrictive lung disease. If they did develop that, they would require BiPAP, bi bi-level positive airway pressure. Many of the patients develop sleep apnea that's often central or mixed, obstructive and central. And if they're developing daytime hypersomnolence, I send them for a polysomnogram. They need a slip lamp exam for the reasons I mentioned to rule out uh, polychromatic like Christmas tree cataracts. And I, that has to be at least once a year if they become symptomatic. They, they're at increased risk of hearing loss. And if, they become, if, if there's any concern for that, I send them for an audiometry evaluation. Every year at a minimum, I check for diabetes with the glycosin and hemoglobin, TSH, and usually do a lipid panel. And then I, the malignancy risk is increased, but it's not so dramatically increased that I do routine malignancy surveys. But, but I, so I will if there's any concern about it. I have a heightened suspicion for that possibility. So I will if there's concern for the possibility in any given patient. So I just want to speak a little bit more detail about the cardiac manifestations of myotonic dystrophy which are the most important, I think, other than the restory involvement, I guess. And, and, and the most important in regard to leading to, to, to death at an early, a premature death in these patients. So often they get conduction defects, most commonly uh, AV cart block, mostly at first degree, but then over time, second, third degree. They can get bundle branch block at the, to maybe 10 to 15% of the time, so not as commonly. Some of them get AFib, flutter, up to about 11%. And they can, they're going to be at higher risk of stroke as a consequence. They do get structural defects as well, usually left ventricular hypertrophy most commonly, maybe about a fifth of the patients. Decreased left ventricular injection fractions occur over, over periods of time, maybe in about a sixth of the patients. They can get left atrial enlargement uncommonly, and very uncommonly, cardiomyopathy or CHF. I have a patient who has cardiomyopathy I just saw recently, but I don't usually see that in these patients. It's usually more the conduction defects. And, and the main concern is sudden death, cardiac sudden death. About 30% of patients um, will, will have this, especially if they're not being monitored very carefully. And so there is some recent literature that prophylactic patient uh, pacing clearly improves the outcome. And, and, but I'm not going to go into great detail about that for the sake of time. So when in doubt in these patients, I send them on to cardiology for sure. What's interesting is there are some risk factors for the requirements for pacemaker implantation that have been worked out. And um, so not every patient, uh, the, the risk is going to not, not going to be exactly the same for every myotonic dystrophy patient. So patients who, in this study that was published a couple years ago uh, by this group in Europe, in this study, the ability of patients to be pacemaker uh, free was much greater, much more, much less in patients over the age of four, at 42 years from the time of onset or the time they're being monitored at least than those who are younger. There's also a relationship with the CTG repeat expansion. The longer the, the CTG, this is supposed to be greater than 850, the longer the repeat expansion over 850, um, the, the greater the risk that they're going to require a pacemaker compared to those less than 850. And then, of course, the, as you might imagine, the baseline EKG, if it's normal, the risk is much lower than if they're already demonstrating first degree AV block at the onset of the, you know, their very first evaluation, or, left, or even more so left hemi block, or anything else, any other major conduction defect. So I'm, I alluded to the, some, some exciting new developments, at least potentially, if leading to disease-modifying therapy for myotonic dystrophy type 1, and this would be true for type 2. And I think the most exciting development is, is the advent of an antisense oligonucleotide therapy. And this has been spearheaded by a, a, a biotech company called Ionis. It used to be called Isis, which, of course, was not a great name to have, so they, they actually changed it a couple years ago. So they're not doing this just for myotonic dystrophy. They're, they did a small study in, in familial ALS, and they're looking at spinal muscular atrophy patients, too. So they're doing clinical trials. They're small to begin with, but there is a phase one, phase two clinical trial myotonic dystrophy type two. It's actually nearing the end. I haven't heard any, any information about it thus far. So this is just exactly what I told you before about what we think happens in this disease. There's this protein called muscle blind. And ordinarily, muscle blind is required to splice all these different messenger RNAs that, that are encoding for different genes that, that are required um, normally, including the chloride channel gene, insulin, et cetera. 
And so mutant DMPK leads to sequestration of muscle blind in the nucleus by these defective um, forms of, mes of messenger RNA. Um, and then splicing is impaired for some of these genes, maybe not completely, but enough to affect the translation of the gene products. And so what antisense oligonucleotides are, are RNA-like material that binds to sequences of the mutant messenger RNA, attracts, they attracts uh, this enzyme called RNAs H that then destroys that, that mutant messenger RNA. So there's no sequestration of muscle blind, and then there's normal splicing. So theoretically, this should work pretty well in myotonic dystrophy. So hopefully it will, but we don't know yet. Any questions about the dystrophic myotonias? Does it work in mice or yeah, experimental animals? Yes, it does. It actually, um, there was a study that was published by, so the question Dr. Swanson asked, does it work in mice? There is a mouse model for myotonic dystrophy, and don't ask me how it was, how it's created. There are different mouse models for myotonic dystrophy. And you remember Thurman Wheeler. Yeah. So Thurman Wheeler is one of our former residents who um, left um, left the full, did a neuromuscular fellowship at University of Rochester, stayed on there, and is no longer there, but it was there for like 10 years. And he, he trained under a very prominent myotonic dystrophy uh, basic scientist, Charles Thornton. And he published a study, I want to say in Nature, where he looked at antisense oligonucleotides or once or in in a mouse model for myotonic dystrophy, and they found there was dramatic amelioration of the phenotype, including the myotonic discharges. They just they, they were dramatically reduced in this in this animal model. So that's what led to the this current trial. So and if you ask me about toxicity, I don't think there was any clear toxicity in the mouse, but I always find that challenge. You know what what's toxic in a mouse? Is yeah. there any sort of thinking in terms of? whether this would still be effective if there was significant muscle damage late in the disease process versus that, that's needing a, to do it early? That's a great question. I would think that you, it would make more sense to do it earlier, especially when I mean, you have a dystrophic appearance to the muscle. The question is whether we, if you wait too long, is it not going to help? For the muscle part of it, the weakness part, it probably won't. Uh, won't help as much because over time, muscle gets replaced by fat and fibrous connective tissue, and then there aren't viable muscle or a reduced number of viable muscle <coughs> fibers to recover. So yes, I think if ultimately you'd want to do it early, and I don't know what the requirements are for the clinical trial, if they have to be relatively early in the diagnosis. Do we screen DM1 right now with new, any of the newborn <coughs> stuff? Or it's I, you mean routinely? I mean, this would change that conceivably because there would yeah. be a, yeah. So the question is whether do genetic testing in, in newborns or higher incidence, lower index of suspicion, like we do maybe, that's this come up for ALS too, because um, there isn't isn't great treatment at all for ALS. And um, and we don't generally do we don't have to do genetic testing to make a diagnosis of ALS or myotonic dystrophy though we generally do so it's probably not going to be as much of an issue for myotonic dystrophy because we're generally doing the genetic testing anyway but um, but I think in the future if it becomes a viable treatment sure we're going to have to want to have a lower index of suspicion for doing genetic testing so we we increase the likelihood we're going to get patients to the right therapy. Cool. All right, so I'm going to switch gears now and talk about non-dystrophic myotonia. And this is just a it's sort of an entertaining video, which you all probably know what this is. That's oh, Dr. Swanson, you gave it away. Oh, I thought you probably did. So this is um, the fainting goat. So, so I don't want to turn this. This is like a hillbilly who's yelling at the goat. So we don't want to. Yeah, he sounds. Doesn't it sound like a hillbilly? So people breed these goats, which I think is kind of sad because. They're, yeah, sure, they're, it's sort of amusing, but it's also kind of sad. What if this was a, was a human being <laughs> falling to the ground? You wouldn't laugh at that person. So I, I don't know. So, but nonetheless, they, mute, they breed these goats. They have a, a mutation that's analogous to human myotonia congenita. And so human myotonia congenita is due to, as we'll talk about in a moment, mutations in the chloride channel 1 gene. And that's basically what these animals have, myotonia congenita. Um, and so what they're doing is not feigning when they're startled or they tr and they try to run fast to get away from whoever is startling them. They stiffen up and they fall to the ground because their muscles don't work temporarily. So these, this is the prototypical non-dystrophic myotonia, but there are other my non-dystrophic myotonias I'm going to talk about as well. And so these are my so non-dystrophic myotonias are myotonia with without fixed weakness or muscle atrophy, 
And in fact, sometimes these patients actually have hypertrophy of their muscles because their muscles are working extra hard and then they get bigger for that reason. This is a lot less common than myotonic dystrophy, of prevalence about 1 to 100,000, although I do think it goes underdiagnosed sometimes. And uh, especially in the adult population, I don't think it's on a lot of neurologists' radar. Pediatric, maybe more so. And it often it's more, di it's more likely to be diagnosed in the pediatric population. And so this can be subdivided into those um, diseases that affect skeletal muscle chloride channels um, with genetic, specific genetic mutations, and that would be myotonia congenita, the Becker form, which is the recessive form, and the Thompson form, which is the dominant form, or those that affect skeletal muscle sodium channel, uh, that, 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 those, that gene, and cause specific mutations there. And that includes paramyotonia congenita, and then the so-called sodium channel myotonias, which the other name for, for these disorders is potassium aggravated myotonias, which um, because they're exquisitely sensitive to dietary potassium. And these include myotonia fluctuans, myotonia permanens, and acetazolamide responsive myotonia. So this is just an example of the chloride channel one gene. This is showing cartoon of that with all the different missense mutations accounting that we know of. I don't remember if this is missing some. I, I, I think this is a relatively up-to-date cartoon um, that are dominant or the Thompson form recessive, the Becker form, and then mutations in, uh, again, uh, typically point mutations in, in NAV 1.4 channel gene or SCN4A, which cause, depending upon the mutation, either potassium aggravated myotonia or, or uh, paramyotonia congenita or even hyperkalemic periodic paralysis and I'm leaving this out of this discussion because this is characterized primarily by paralysis, so that some of these patients do get myotonic discharges and myotonia. So let's talk about myotonia congenita. And, and as I mentioned, there's an uh, also a dominant and also a recessive form, Thompson and Becker, respectively. And the, the dominant form occurs in the first decade of life, the recessive form usually a little bit later, second data, early second decade of life. And it's characterized by complaints of muscle stiffness. So children will say, I'm just stiffening up if I do certain activities. Well, I've seen a lot of kids who I did diagnose because they were older, they're tweens or preteen. No, preteen. Do we call them preteens or tweens? I, I can't remember the name anymore. So they're preteen and then they're teens, and sometimes teenagers. They're very active. They're on a baseball team or a soccer team. And then when they try to run around the bases, let's say, they initially will stiffen up. They don't, won't necessarily fall to the ground, but if they keep doing what they're doing, they get, they, it stops happening. There's a warming up of phenomenon. That's mm. characteristic of myotonia congenita. It decreases with successive movements. Um, it tends to also be most prominent in the legs. So it's usually the sports where the kids are running around, where I see it. Or I had, I had one patient who, who never was very athletic and he said, I would climb upstairs and my leg would stiffen up and I'd sometimes fall. Now he would actually fall. And, and so sometimes they also have weakness after rest, but typically it's just the Becker form. Usually weakness isn't, doesn't predominate in this disorder. They don't have much of an effect from cold, which is distinguished from paramyotonia congenita. So one of the pearls that distinguishes those two diseases, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, paramyotonia congenita is very sensitive to cold. And then the EMG just says myotonic discharges without any changes in the motor unit. So it doesn't affect the muscle fibers directly in a way that would affect their morphology. They usually have normal or modestly elevated CK levels. And they'll have missense mutations in the chloride channel 1 gene, as I mentioned. Sometimes they'll have muscle hypertrophy. So this is a fellow who, I don't remember if this is Thompson or Becker form, who doesn't lift weights but has very prominent mu uh, muscles. You can sometimes see this in the, in the little kids who have this, too who clearly aren't lifting weights. And so one way to distinguish this disease besides the clinical phenotype from other forms of non-dystrophic myotonia is something called the short exercise test. So those of you who know anything about, and I don't know if anybody in this room has, knows anything, other than Dr. Swanson maybe, knows anything about, we know Annie will. Non-EMG, your production? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So, so okay. basically, not necessarily exercise testing. So. So short exercise testing is a, is a, is a specific ut utilization of motor nerve conduction. Motor nerve conduction or motor evoked potentials where we're stimulating the motor nerve and typically in the case of short exercise testing, it's the median nerve and recording over the thenar muscles in the hand. And what we do is we keep going up on the stimulus intensity and looking at this waveform on an oscilloscope until the waveform gets as big as it, it could get. And that 
um, and then we go even a little bit beyond that to make sure that we're super maximal, we're stimulating all the motor nerve axons that make up that particular nerve. And so once we do that, we have a good sense of, of all the muscle, so the, the content of the muscle, fi of the, mu the motor nerves that are making up that nerve and their ability to depolarize the muscle. So what happens with short exercise is we get the patients to exercise, and in the case of the thenar muscles of the hand, we might get them to activate their APB muscle for 10 seconds against resistance, and then we immediately give them additional shocks that are also super maximal every 10 seconds for up to 60 seconds, or this is not quite 60 seconds. And, um, and then we'll repeat this cycle uh, maybe after another few seconds so that we do three of these cycles of short exercise testing. And here, this is in myotonia congenita, we're looking at a decrement, a real profound drop in the amplitude, temporarily with dramatic recovery back to near the baseline by 60 seconds out. This is this procedure that was characterized by Strebe, and then it was taken to another level, and that was about 30 years ago, by this group in, in, the, in Europe, Matthews, and then uh, Dr. Fournier, and they came up with these specific patterns that would help characterize various forms of non-dystrophic myotonians. And so this is the, the Becker form, or myotonia congenita, and this exhibits Fournier pattern two. And this is the percentage on the, the y-axis. The CMAP amplitude is a percentage of the baseline and over time. And these are ones, one of these short exercise sets of short exercise, another one, and another one. They're all being done over the course of about three minutes. And so you can see that also there's, it's being done with either room temperature, room temperature or after cooling. There's no difference with cooling or room temperature. And you can see there's an immediate dramatic decrement, about 40%, that quickly recovers back to the baseline. Then with successive trials, that decrement go, starts to get better and better. Or it starts to, you know, now it's only 20% by the last trial. This goes along with the warming up effect that we talked about, which is very prominent in Becker myotonia congenita. So this is one test that, that's very helpful, and it would distinguish it from paramyotonia congenita, as I'll mention in a moment. In, in autosomal dominant myotonia congenita, uh, or Becker's, the uh, Thompson form, rather, you see a different, you can see the same form that I showed you for the recessive form, but sometimes these patients don't have a warming up effect. They don't have it as commonly. Here there's less of a decrement, no effect with cold, and it doesn't change over t with successive trials. So they're these patients may not have a warming up effect, but they can. So they could either be type pattern two or pattern three. So let's talk now about this, uh, or the sodium channel disorders. And the first one is paramyotonia congenita. This is also autosomal dominant. Um, and it's, a, it's also called Eulenberg's disease, the old name for it. And this is characterized by paradoxical myotonia. Patients actually don't have a warming up effect, but quite the opposite. They get worse with exercise. And they're also exquisitely sensitive to cold. And in fact, if they get cold enough, they can, they can become temporarily weak, sometimes for hours. It also begins earlier in life, usually in infancy. And unlike the legs being the predominant pattern of involvement, in my, which I mentioned for myotonia congenita, here it's more of the face, the tongue, and the hands. And, and, and also the eyelids. So if they're sneezing, sometimes they'll report they can't open up their eyes for a few seconds. But that's, that's affects, affecting their eyelids. They don't usually have hypertrophy of their muscles as well. So it's different in that regard, too. So the genetics of this disease. They, they have point mutations, the SCN4A gene. And this affects the ability for muscle sodium channels to become inactivated. And so they continue to stay open and depolarize in the muscle membrane. They'll have myotonic discharges, which don't distinguish it from these other non-dystrophic myotonias. The motor units look normal with uh, it in normal room at room temperature, but as you cool them, their myotonic discharges actually temporarily increase in density. And they'll have fibrillation potentials appear, which are another form of spontaneous activity. And as they go, they get cooled below 20 degrees Celsius. Everything starts to drop out and disappear. And then the muscle becomes transiently weak, and they develop electrical, <coughs> electrical silence in needle EMG. You don't see that with, my, with any other form of, of non-dystrophic myotonia. So these exhibit this, these patients exhibit Fournier pattern one. Here, they with the first set of short exercise, they have initial increment, and then it's followed by a decrement. They don't recover back to the baseline, and with successive trials, they have more and more of a decrement. This is the opposite of a warming up effect. This is consistent with paradoxical myotonia. 
And then cooling actually makes, us, it makes them have even a greater decrement, as you can see here. So very helpful in distinguishing between paramyotonia congenita and myotonia congenita. So I'm going to move on and talk about what are sometimes known as the sodium channel myotonias. So say technically paramyotonia congenita should be lumped in this group too. Um, that may be why there's a move afoot to try to change the name of this potassium aggravated myotonias or this category of non-dystrophic myotonia. These are patients that have precipitous worsening with, with potassium ingest, ingestion and like paramyotonia congenita are due to point mutations, the SCN4A gene, different ones, and are also autosomal dominant. Unlike paramyotonia congenita, or, and, and, uh, they, don't, it doesn't cause, they don't have weakness. But also, unlike myotonia congenita, they don't have a warming up effect. They don't have the immediate myotonia with exercise. In fact, there's a, a latency, often of up to 30 minutes, from the time they exercise to the time they develop the myotonia. That's very different from, also from paramyotonia congenita. They're also not cold sensitive. The CK doesn't, it can be misleading, can be a little elevated, or it could be normal. And the EMG shows myotonic discharge is not affected by cold, but that's not going to distinguish from myotonia congenita. Um, but we'll talk about, uh, actually, here's the pattern that they have on, on short exercise testing. It's a little different than, it's Fournier pattern three, like autosomal dominant myotonia congenita, but instead of a decrement, they have a little bit of an increment that recovers back to the baseline pretty quickly. There's no effect with cooling. There's no change with successive trials. And these are the three subtypes of the sodium channel myotonias. My, and I'm just going to talk very briefly about them because they're pretty darn, they're even rarer than paramyotonia congenita, which is a lot less common than myotonia congenita. Myotonia fluctuans. This has, as the name suggests, the most variable in its presentation, varies in severity. That's why it's called that, myotonia fluctuans. This is the one that's most exquisitely sensitive to potassium ingestion and prolonged exercise. Myotonia permanens is the most severe form where patients just continue to have myotonia even when they're not really doing much, and it can actually affect the diaphragm. So they can have transient involvement of those muscles and respiratory dysfunction. And then there's something called a citazolamide responsive myotonia, which is an extremely painful form of myotonia that's the most sensitive to carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, in particular as citazolamide. Although these other forms can also respond to a lesser extent to that category of, 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 uh, of medication. So I'm going to talk now about treatments for myotonia. And we already talked about carbonic anhydrase inhibitors for the sodium channel myotonias. And that's based on non-randomized controlled studies. As far as I know, there have never been randomized controlled trial looking at acetazolamide. And then there's, for the remaining non-dystrophic myotonias in the myotonia of myotonic dystrophy, we use sodium channel blockers primarily. And these are either anticonvulsants like gabapentin, carbamazepine, or phenytoin, or, or anti, uh, arrhythm, uh, cardiac arrhythmic agents like quinidine, procanamide, or flecainide, and most recently, mixilatine. And mixilatine is the only drug that's ever been shown to be of benefit in any randomized controlled trial. And there have been a couple of randomized controlled trials for both myotonia and myotonic dystrophy type 1 and then in, in non-dystrophic myotonias. So there was a study that was published by Eric Logesian in 2010, his group, and it was a multi-center North American study published in neurology. It was actually t sort of two studies combined, two double-blind placebo-controlled randomized crossover studies where patients were either given placebo and then they were given either mixilatine, 150 milligrams, three times a day, and then there was a washout period, then they were, cro they were and if they were on placebo, they got the drug, or if they're on the drug, they got, got crossed over to placebo or the other dosing strategy was 200 milligrams three times a day. I have no idea why they did both studies. I guess they're hedging their bets. Um, there's not much of a difference in those. I mean, that's 600 versus 450. That's not a dramatic difference in the dosing. Um, but, but each group, there were 20 myotonic dystrophy one patients who had to exhibit grip myotonia or percussion myotonia. That was the criteria. And there's a seven week, there's seven week treatment periods separated by the four to eight week washout periods hugely long washout period. I don't know why the washout period was that long. With the primary endpoint being the time for isometric grip force to relax from 90 to 5% of the peak force after three second grip contraction. And to do that, you use a, they were using a dynamometer, handheld dynamometer. This isn't probably the same one. This is a JAMR dynamometer that can measure force. This is a normal patient. These are just, just examples. And with the relaxation time of 0.31 seconds, 
a, a, um, D, a myotonic dystrophy of one patient with a relaxation time of 3.75 seconds, the same myotonic dystrophy of one patient getting 200 milligrams three times a day of mixolteen, now with a relaxation time of 0 0.25 seconds. And the comparisons with the baseline parameters in placebo for both doses of mixolteen were highly significant, in, and there's a reduction of about 50%, uh, maybe more than, more, than, more than 50 percent of the relaxation time. So very significant difference. Is there any, was, si any side effects from mixolitin? Yeah, I'm sorry. So they, there are side, they're always side they're almost always the same. They were the same in my, AL, I did an ALS trial with the drug. Uh, nausea, gastrointestinal symptoms, sometimes dizziness, occasionally tremor. So nausea is the most concerning. Uh, there are occasionally patients with EKG parameter changes in both the studies I'm talking about, but by and large, because they, uh, there were no major EKG changes, even in myotonic dystrophy 1, which is a disease in which they can get cardiac conduction defects. So um, I think it's a pretty safe medicine. In, in type 1 patients, you're going to probably want to monitor EKGs more frequently. I, I just do a baseline EKG in a patient who doesn't have type 1 and maybe have one follow-up EKG, and if it looks normal, I don't do it again. I haven't been doing routine screening EKGs. And so the non-dystrophic myotonias, they, they also show benefit with mixiltine. This is a study that was a North American and European multicenter study. Seven centers, it was double-blind randomized controlled study using 200 milligrams three times a day mixiltine or placebo. There were 59 patients studied. And here the, the treatment period I think was a little more reasonable, four weeks. But the washout period is actually quite short. It was only one week. It's probably okay because the half-life of the drug isn't all that long. And here the primary endpoint was severity on a voice activator, interactive voice response diary from one to nine, nine being the most amount of stiffness, one being minimal stiffness. Every day the patients had to call in and leave their number. That's how it was done. First time I think it's ever been done like this for any similar study. So it's their qualitative assessment. Yeah. Okay. And so here are the, the weekly average severity scores from mixiltine to placebo, and these are the means down here at week three and week four when they're on mixiltine, and then here at placebo, the last two weeks on placebo. And it goes from about two and a half to a little bit more than five. It gets twice as bad on placebo. And then it, it goes from about 4.2 to one and a half. It's a little bit more than two and a half times better going from placebo to mixiltine. These are significant comparisons. The relaxation time with handheld dynamometry is similar to about two-fold improvement, uh, two, or sorry, two-fold worsening from mixiltine to placebo, maybe not quite two-fold improvement from placebo to mixiltine, but these are significant comparisons. And then the density of the myotonic discharges are also great, looked at, and they were graded from three plus, seeing them pretty much every muscle, uh, every area of the muscle is putting a needle in the muscle. Two plus, maybe more than 50% of the areas of the muscle they looked at. One plus, uh, minimal, you know, maybe just a few areas of the muscle or zero, no myotonic discharges. And you can see there's a shift in placebo from three plus to more one and two plus. And that was significant too, the comparisons there. There are also significant improvement on quality of life measures like short form 36. So in the remaining few minutes, I'm going to talk about disorders that can mimic myotonic disorders that are important to remember. And, and the first one, is, I'm just going to talk about a case. A 68-year-old woman presents with progressive painless proximal limb weakness for one week with rapid progression, inability to walk, myoglobinuria, and CK of 22, over 22,000. And these are myotonic discharges. This is it's either waxing and waiting. The baseline is con constricted here. Here it's spread out. And so these are the, what we're called the acquired myotonias. And these are medications that cause myotonic discharges in addition to weakness, but, aren't, but, but no clinical myotonia. And the prototypical category of these is statins, which cause muscle pain and weakness in a small percentage of patients, sometimes with rhabdomyolysis. Other cholesterol-lowering agents sometimes can, in particular, clofibrate. The rheumatologists and dermatologists use a drug, um, drugs that are in the chloroquine family that can do this. They also cause neuropathy in addition to myopathy with weakness. And then colchicine, which is anti-gout medicine. All of these can affect the muscle, cause different, um, cause degeneration of the muscle. And on needle EMG, they can have prominent myotonic discharges. Uh, statin therapy deserves a sp little special attention. And these patients often develop muscle pain, weakness, increased CK, 
around the time, shortly after they start the drug, they don't always get rhabdomyolysis. The, usually it's about six, within six months on the average. And the EMG could look a lot like a myotonic myopathy. Um, hopefully that wouldn't be mistaken if somebody thinks about the fact they're a patient on statin therapy, but they do get frequent myotonic discharges in many muscles. But over time, there's, if they're taken off the statin therapy, everything gets better, usually within a couple months on the average. Simvastatin is the most likely to cause muscle toxicity, usually doses of 80 milligrams or above, with rosuvastatin, prevastatin, and fluvastatin the least, especially when those drugs are given every other day as opposed to daily. And in fact, if they, get, they have, a, have myotoxicity with simvastatin or whatever drug, they can be rechallenged with one of these latter three drugs. It's not unreasonable once they recover. It's also important to remember that some patients don't get better and they get, continue to get weak, and those are patients you want to, re, um, uh, want to think about an auto, autoimmunity, current, autoantibody being found that could be targeting the muscle to HMG-CoA reductase, which is a much a very uncommon form of muscle disease occurring as an effect of statin therapy, less common than the other more traditional myotoxicity, but something that can happen. And they, they, those are patients that might respond to steroids or IVIG. The last thing I want to talk about are disorders that are myopathies that can be seen very frequently with myotonic discharges that could again mimic myotonic dystrophy. And those include acid maltase deficiency or pompies, a disease called myofibrillar myopathy, which is a, looks similar to limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and, but may present a little later in life at times. <coughs> they often have, I guess that would look more like myotonic dystrophy type 2, and then sporadic inclusion body myositis. And those patients often get a lot of hand weakness that might look like myotonic dystrophy, although they usually present later in life. And then there are rare other myopathies where you can see myotonic discharges, again, without myotonia on exam, or you wouldn't see percussion myotonia. That would be myxedematous myopathy, amyloid, amyloidosis, and even some neurogenic disorders. Sometimes you can see myotonic discharges in some muscles like Lou Gehrig's disease or peripheral neuropathy or radiculopathy. So um, the thing that can distinguish all of these diseases, besides, besides obviously genetic testing for myotonic dystrophy, is the muscle biopsy. In Pompe's disease, they get these characteristic vacuoles in the muscle that are on PAS staining, which stands for glycogen, are filled with glycogen. It's a glycogen storage disease. Myofibrillar myopathy in addition to fiber size variability, like I showed you for myotonic dystrophy and internalization of nuclei, you can see these see this little orangish discoloration. These are called spheroid bodies or cytoplasmic bodies. Oops, missed that. And then you can see these these other um, modified Gomori trichrome, other things accumulate in the muscle. Uh, these are aggregates of some kind. And then this, on electron microscopy. The Z-band is what anchors the myofibers and allows them to interdigitate to allow for muscle contraction. And you can see it clearly here. This is the Z-band, but you don't see it here. It's all degenerated. And that's called Z-band streaming, and that is the prototypical feature of myofibrillar myopathy where the myofibers are not, not are affected due to mutations that prevent their anchoring to the Z-band. Sporadic inclusion body myositis, you would see inflammation invading non-necrotic muscle fibers and these are rim vacuoles, little holes in the muscle that contain granular material around the edge. And um, you would not see those in myotonic dystrophy. So in conclusion, uh, myotonic disor disorders are typically due, and just the whole totality of them, to dysfunction of skeletal muscle soda sodium or chloride channels. They can be subcategorized into those that are dystrophic, like the myotonic dystrophies, or the non-dystrophic forms, like myotonia congenita or paramyotonia congenita. Um, type 1 and type 2 myotonic dystrophy are characterized by myotonia that's evident um, either the patient's symptomatic or on, with percussion, although a lot less likely to see that with type 2, uh, with myotonic discharges, but fixed weakness. And you, and you don't see that in the non-dystrophic myotonians, typically. Myotonia congenita is characterized by a warm up, warming up phenomenon. They get better after they initially stiffen up if they continue to exercise. Paramyotonia congenita is exquisitely cold sensitive, where patients get worse as they continue to exercise, and that's paradoxical myotonia. And then the potassium aggravated myotonia is sort of the newer name, I think, for sodium channel myotonias. They exquisitely worsen with ingestion of potassium. It's important to be aware of medications that can cause muscle toxicity, including weakness with associated myotonic discharges, but not clinical myotonia.
And that's also true for myopathies, where you can see myotonic discharges without clinical myotonia, and in particular, Pompe's myofibrillar myopathy and sporadic inclusion body myositis. And for therapies, it's important to remember that these patients can survive longer um, if you're monitoring them carefully for respiratory failure, but in particular, cardiac monitoring. EKGs should be done uh, periodically, and if need be, the cardiologist should get involved early, and they might be candidates for pacing. And then in terms of symptomatic myotonia, all of the forms of the myotonic disorders that we talked about that cause clinic symptomatic myotonia, including the dystrophic and non-dystrophic myotonias respond to sodium channel blockers best, especially mixilatine. And then the potassium aggravated myotonias, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, especially acetazolamide. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm happy to take any questions that you, you guys want to <coughs> have. Thanks for your attention. Okay, so let's see. Uh, so somebody said, I presume DMPK is expressed throughout body given the multi-system involvement. Uh, are all the symptoms of myotonic dystrophy one believed to be due to chloride channel dysfunction, loss of function, or does mutant DMPK affect other proteins as well? Uh, that was, yes, so Chris, this is Chris Ransom. Yeah, sorry I didn't make that clear. So I just showed an example of chlor the chloride channel gene being affected um, and how it's likely affected in regard to what we know about the gene, but this is that's true of a, a multitude of cells of other um, cells that are affected in the body, like um, in, insulin gene is probably or other genes I should say. Insulin gene, the thyroid, some of the thyroid hormone, the gene that encodes for thyroid hormone. Uh, no, numerous genes are likely affected here due to impaired splicing. And actually, Leo actually said that in his in a response to Chris. So thank you, Leo. Uh, for clarifying that. So um, any other questions, anything else that anybody want to ask me about in regard to this? Well, thanks everybody for staying awake and paying attention. I hope, I hope everybody got a, got a chance to get some pizza and um, hopefully you'll be able to recognize myotonic dystrophy and non-dystrophic myotonies in the future. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You.